Hello and welcome to another video from Flurry's development team. My name is Andrew Johnson and I'm a software engineer at Flurry PBC. Today we'll be doing a quick demo to talk about how easy it is to connect front-end web apps to Flurry if you're using Flurry DB for your data management needs. At Flurry we often talk about how we're not just a database, um, we actually provide a full data management solution. A great example of that um, is visible and, and looking at how easy it is to integrate front-end web, web apps with Flurry's uh, back-end. Uh, part of why that's so possible is that the query language we use um, is a graph-style query language and it works very plays very nicely with Flurry because Flurry is an RDF-style graph database. Uh, you've probably heard of Facebook's GraphQL query language, um, and we are fully compatible with that as well as with Sparkle. And our own query language wraps the capabilities of both of those and is really formatted just as a typical JSON object. Um, so it's very readable and easy to work with with your front-end development teams. If you've heard of, of GraphQL, then you probably know that one thing it makes possible is the, the need to bypass entirely the sort of middle layer of business logic that APIs usually handle. And the same is true with Flurry. Um, we'll be looking at that a little bit today. As we walk through a very basic and pretty simple app, it's just a single page app that I've built out here, a uh, sort of basic content management system for a domain where we have people and events. We'll look at a um, uh, this, this React built front end that's really just going to be a few forms for new people, new events. Once we have some people and events, there'll be a form that appears for associating people to events by way of RSVPs, for instance. And then just some tables that show the sort of data relationships of that and um, make it visible in a sort of in a UI component. We'll take a quick look at, at the React code that makes that possible, but more specifically, we'll look at the ways that queries and transactions are happening from our React front end to the Flurry database and speak a little bit about why we can avoid using an API, how we protect data natively um, with, with Flurry's data management solution, and um, how we're also handling some of the business logic of what data we're, we're exposing, et cetera. But let's just get some data in here to begin. We'll start. I've been watching a good amount of Golden Girls recently, so there might be some Golden Girls inspired data coming in here. Let's just get a couple of people in here. And maybe we'll have one other for now. All right, so we have a few people. Let's say there's going to be a charity ball at the community center and maybe a murder mystery dinner at the old bread, a bed. Oh my gosh, you can't spell bed and breakfast. All right, now that we have some data in our system, we see we have a table of just these people down here. Um, we have two events. We can associate a few of these tables with some, or a few of these people with some events. Let's say Blanche will go to the charity ball. We'll say Rose is going to go to the charity ball as well. And let's say Dorothy is going to go to the murder mystery dinner. And maybe Rose will go to the murder mystery, murder mystery dinner as well. All right. So now we have these, um, these people, the events they're going to, the events, the people who are going to them. Um, and we can if we want, let's say we're done with Blanche. Now we see that the, the data sort of updates very quickly. Um, and this is not anything that you probably can, this is obviously anything you can do with any typical end-to-end uh, -end web app stack. Um, but we're going to talk about how absolutely simple it is to do with Flurry, um, specifically because we really can have our React component speaking uh, really straight to the database as it's being exposed on the database server, um, and how possible that is, but also how, how um, uh, safe and secure that is. Uh, you, probably the concerns you would have if you're used to using a traditional API layer in between the front end and back end. Um, we'll start very quickly by looking at how this is sort of set up in React. Um, it's just, a, again, this is very simple here. I really just have, you know, this person form, event form, associate event, events form, and the index, which is those two tables we saw at the bottom. We'll start by looking at the person form, which is creating um, those person uh, entries in the database. If you're familiar with Flurry, you know that person would be a collection. 
And each of the descriptive points for people in that collection would be what we call predicates. If you're familiar with more of a SQL database, I guess person would be the table. Each row would be, per, person as a category would be the table. Each row would be an individual person entry. And all of those, what I refer to as predicates in Flurry would be a column, uh, different types of data associated with that entry. But down here we see that we have, this is the, the, the full, for each person, the full transaction body here. Um, the square bracket around the curly bracket is, is how, um, again, if you're familiar with Flurry, uh, Flurry's database, if you use the admin UI, for instance, that's just how we differentiate the syntax for, on the one hand, transactions, and on the other hand, queries, which would just have the curly brackets. Um, and other videos explain a bit why we separate queries and transactions, but it's done deliberately um, for speed and scalability, especially when we're imagining a scenario where we would have many, many more queries taking place necessary, uh, perhaps than transactions. Just help scale the one without having to scale them both. But you'll see that, that the, the transaction here is a very basic JavaScript object notation um, object that will get serialized into a string when we um, when we, we when we send it and end this fetch request, but really there's nothing no, nothing too magical going on here. We have the transaction body that's being generated by the form state, and we send that. Flurry fetches a very simple uh, method here. This function is getting called. It just specifies the URI, either this and forward slash transact, or this and forward slash query. The typical fetch options where that transaction JavaScript object is being serialized, is being stringified and uh, included in the body of a post request. And then just a, a promise that resolves that as it as it's um, being transacted and as we get a successful, hopefully a successful response. So very, very simple there. Uh, we'll go through, we'll talk a bit about why we are able to do this and why we don't have to worry so much about the sorts of, um, the, the sorts of things that an API would usually manage there. But we'll quickly look at a query as well. I'll just close this for a second. Let's see, the we can look at a query inside of this um, refresh people function, which is gonna take place when we are querying the people from the database. You'll see again, we have a JavaScript object. And um, if you're familiar with GraphQL or, or Sparkle, then this probably makes sense to you as well. We're essentially asking for all the people from a person collection, this is what that uh, asterisk operator is doing here. And then we're also crawling the relationship if there is a predicate person events, which is a multi-reference point to all the events associated with each individual person. Person, We're also crawling that for all those events for each individual person. That's what's giving us down in here in this table, you know, Rose Nyland with this email address, but also all the events that are associated with her. Now we can look in another video or on our docs, you can we can explore a little more of the sort of uh, advanced and analytical queries made possible by our query language. But it is worth just very quickly noticing that in this particular setup, I have two collections, events and persons. What we really only need is this association from person to events here. This is a, a, a predicate of type reference, and multiple, uh, references multiple different events, and it's restricted to just events. We don't really need this backwards reference from events to attendees, where each attendee is a person. I'm doing it sort of for ease of, um, just for ease of queries in this case. It, it is absolutely redundant, but what we do have possible within Flurry is to do something like, for each event, crawl backwards to each person. You absolutely can do that. For this video, I just wanted to keep it a little simpler, so we're being a little more redundant than we need to be. But let's see, for instance, maybe one objection that comes up is, okay, what happens if um, you submit data that we don't want to allow? Um, that data that would, for instance, um, let's think we're, uh, there's a, someone trying to make a person, but they're using an email address that's already that's already been part of the database. We certainly wouldn't want, if, if the email address was the unique identifier that's helping us identify each person, we certainly wouldn't want more than one person to be associated with the same email address. That's something that we can very easily imagine, easily imagine that our API in another scenario would be taken care of. Well, let's see what happens if we do that. So let's say we try to add Sophia 
Trillo, but we're going to give her rows at test.com, which is, of course, already associated with this, with this particular person. If we submit it, we get an error response. Um, and it's the exact sort of error response we would want a front-end developer to be able to see. So essentially, without an API, we're able to get an error that tells us specifically the issue with that, with that particular request. In this case, the sub, um, there is already a subject with that person email predicate, and we aren't allowing duplicates in this, in this database. If you have familiar, familiarity with GraphQL, this might not be a surprise to you, but, but essentially, in a graph-style query language, what you want and what Flurry natively implements is that the schema that you're, that you're building for the, that's organizing the data in your database is also a schema um, that's going to be very important for your front-end developers. It works essentially more than just an architecture for your backend uh, for, your, for your database itself, it also works as a sort of living contract between what is allowed on the front end and what is allowed on the back end. Um, essentially, the way that these collections and predicates, the, 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 the things you would want to associate a rule with, the way that those are the data structure, the data architecture of that and the database is built up, is built up so that every time that they are queried or transacted, uh, to even get to that data, a series of rules have to be checked. And we have set up a rule in this scenario where emails are a unique predicate for each particular data structure. But you can imagine a rule where you say something like emails have to follow, email addresses have to follow a certain format and you have a regular expression or um, you know, a scenario where there's uh, license identifications, uh, a particular identification number, and you want that identification number to follow a certain format but also have a certain range, you can imagine that as well. It's very easy to implement very sort of basic operations of max integer. Um, a certain thing can only have a sum up to a certain point. Um, a certain query can only come from a certain auth ID. Um, a certain query can only select a certain number of entries at once. Uh, truly, any rule you can really imagine, it's very, very simple to implement as a very basic query or transaction spec that is essentially having to get uh, having to, to get past having to be um, completed before we can before we can get any data or transact any data as we want. So the the Flurry database makes it necessary, depending on the the sort of rules being set up when the database is being set up, to follow certain business abide by certain business logic um, or follow certain security authorization protocols in order to transact or query data at the basic level, which also means that the front end is, is still going through these same sorts of rigors that it would have to go through if we were working with an API. Um, the other thing worth mentioning is that you could never really imagine a situation like this with a SQL database, just in part because you know, this, structure of, um, this structure of a query is not at all what a SQL query would look like. The nice thing about graph query languages is that we very easily can move from one relationship to another as we do here from all the attributes of a person all of a sudden moving into all the attributes of events associated with it. And we could very easily just say here for instance name or location or alternatively what we're saying here is event name or event location. At this point we're describing data relevant specifically to events. Um, we don't have to do any sort of uh, you know, complicated uh, syntax involving joins here. Um, graph query languages make it very, very easy to sort of traverse back and forth and through very complicated nested relationships uh, along the associate, association lines of your data. Of course, that's even easier if your data is also organized itself in um, a graph style database which makes references from one collection to another uh, very natively very easy because that's the way that the data itself is stored um, in this case by way of RDF triples within the database. And that really should sum up everything we have to say about how, how simple this all is. You see that you know we really are just working with um, you know 300 lines here but the, the most of that is just organizing the tables and forms and columns. The, the bulk of the, the actual um, fetch request, the bulk of the, the request responses happening from the front to the back end are really tremendously simple. They, were, they involve a very simple fetch and uh, you know, very simple query and um, 
and, and transaction syntax, which mirrors, if you're familiar with our admin console, mirrors the exact same syntax we would use up here if we were, for instance, selecting all the IDs from an event, selecting all the data from the event collection, for instance. It's the exact same syntax you're using in the UI, um, and that's really just stringified and put into the body of a POST request, um, making the whole end-to-end uh, -end web development experience very simple. I hope this has been helpful. If you have any questions, as always, please feel free to reach out to us by email or by joining our Slack channel. And go ahead and go to our website and download Flurry locally to give it a try. Um, we're very excited for you to see what we've developed. Thanks very much.